Evening everybody, thank you very much for turning up um, to the evening. Um, I know you're going to have questions, so I'm going I'm to kick off on the subjects that we're talking about, prepping your bike for your blasts, for your track days, stuff like that. Uh, the bit you may find most informative and useful is the little bit that talks about suspension um, and all the myths, well not all the myths, but some of the myths that surround that. <clears throat> so I'll kick it off and then uh, as we kind of pause after each subject, I'll take some questions on it and, and uh, you can fire away from there. Um, I mean, the obvious stuff, I, I, I'm sure you guys are, are, are aware, but I'm going to say it all again anyway, because I, I have seen some atrocious stuff uh, come in the workshop sometimes. You know, after your bike's been laid up for a long winter, uh, if you haven't been optimating the, the, the uh, battery over the winter period, then that's something you ought to seriously think about doing, making sure it's been uh, put on an optimate before it goes out there on the road. Remember that your brake fluid has sat in there for ages. It starts to break down, it starts to get air in it, it even starts to get water in it. And you know, it's not a bad idea for the summer goes to, to change your front and rear brake fluid, especially your front. Go through your bike, check your brake pads, make sure that your oil seals are not leaking on your forks, stuff like that. Make sure your lights are working, make sure you put some lube on your chain. I don't think you need to go quite to the Scott Oiler territory, I mean, it depends, I just find they kind of make the bike look very gunky. Um, but you know, make sure you do your chain on a fairly regular basis and make sure you check your tyres, make sure they're to the right pressures. I've seen tyre pressures so low that the bikes have come in where the tyre is worn on the outer edges and they've still got good tread in the middle and you don't see that very often. So. Uh, make sure that you run through those checks. Make sure you give it an oil change, make sure you give it a filter change, <clears throat> and just pay it some attention, especially if it's a roadworthy bike. And take your bodywork off and give it a good jet wash down and get all the crap and the crud out from underneath it and around the bottom of the shock and stuff like that. Just keep her nicely greased up and, and, and well oiled. Um, for those of you that go track daying, uh, then that's a kind of different kettle of fish. Um, now we start to look at the bike slightly differently. And one of the things that you never ever want to do when you go to a track day is embarrass yourself by dropping oil around the circuit. So it really is worthwhile learning how to lock wire a bike. And all the bits that you use to lock wire it are not expensive to buy. Um, you're talking about a sump plug, and you're talking about uh, plastic filicat where the oil goes. Um, so on the, on, the, on the oil filter, you want to put a Jubilee clip around it, and then you want to find some, some way of wiring that Jubilee clip up. So basically, it cannot turn, which means the oil filter cannot turn. Um, the other thing that you want to do is where your oil filler cap is, drill a little hole through that, make sure that you get yourself another bit of lock wire, and lock wire that to something as well. So there's no ways that can come undone and spray off. Because the first thing you'll know, well, second thing you'll know about it is you'll be on your backside. The first thing you might notice is that your right leg's getting very warm, uh, and that tends to be the oil spilling out of the motor. So those are two little, real simple preps that I really recommend that you do. And during the uh, summer months as well, you can change your coolant out for uh, water instead of coolant. Because if you go down the radiator brakes and it puts coolant over the track that is pretty much going to ruin the day uh, and you don't want to be the person that uh, that does that but they're the, some of the basic things that you can do um, but the more technical stuff which goes into you guys that are on the road and on the racetrack is this gear um, suspension uh, you know for most people it's a myth for me it's still fairly much a myth but I do understand a lot of the basics of it and um, and I want to talk through some of those things with you tonight so that you get some ideas about what you do when you start twiddling these things. Now, the first thing you've got to remember is, is that a motorcycle that is manufactured for the road, um, the suspension will not work to the range that something like this will, which is a, a, you know, a piece of aftermarket equipment. Now, there's a good reason why they manufacturers do that. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. If you take... Um, uh, the rebound setting. Uh, on a racing bike you can keep winding the rebound setting in and I'll tell you more about what that is later um, until the point where the forks don't move and if they don't move effectively you haven't got any and you will crash. 
So no, no manufacturer can afford for you to do that. So the range is simplified for you, so you can't enter that kind of territory. But when you use this stuff, you can enter that kind of territory. So it's quite important to know what knobs you're twiddling, ladies and gentlemen. So um, if you look at this unit here, this is what they call three-way competition shock. Three-way because it has got high and low compression damping. It's got, well, I should say, it's got high speed compression damping here, low speed compression damping here, rebound damping here, and this is your preload, and we'll go on to that a little bit later. Now, I'm just gonna make this as simple as, as is possible, just so you get the basics of what's going on with something like this. High speed compression. A high speed compression of a fork would be classic when I was sleeping policeman in a row. You, know, you get that sudden bang, that initial bang when you hit it, and that's because it's such a quick motion that the, the shock effectively locks up, and that's why you get that that real bang motion when you hit one of those things. So high speed is when the shock really has to move fast. So it's kind of bumps and uh, 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 maybe a series of ripples, anything like that on the road, typical stuff that you would see out there, you know, drain hole covers and whatnot. If you hit those and they're slightly sunken, that's gonna be a high speed compression of the, of the shock. And that is controlled in this particular case by this little blue one here. And it, they normally have high written on them and low written on them as these have got. The little silver one here is low speed compression. So that's basic undulation of the fork or the shock, I should say. So it's a slower motion. Whereas, as I said, your high speed one is a bang, a jolt like that. So this little fella here is controlling how quickly the shock is moving. And if the whole thing is kind of wallowing about a bit, if you put high, uh, low speed compression onto that, you will effectively stiffen that up a little bit and you will slow that motion down. So <clears throat> high speed compression, shock is being literally compressed. Low, low speed compression, exactly the same thing just at a slower speed. That's what those two units do. This one down here at the bottom is called rebound. It's a very, very important one. This controls the rate at which the shock returns after it's been compressed. Now you don't want it to return really quickly because it'll almost push out the seat. So you want to put some form of control on there, but you don't want to put too much control on there because then what the shock can do is called jack down. And effectively, it goes down under compression, it tries to return, but it's very slow. Then it hits another compression and it basically keeps doing that till it reaches the bottom. And when it reaches the bottom, you haven't got any suspension left and you're gonna fall off. So rebound has quite a big effect all round. And also it has a big effect on tire wear, particularly at racetracks when you're getting onto the gas, because this unit here has got to work. When you open that throttle, she's basically got to soak up the power. And if she doesn't soak up the power, the tire will, and then you'll have really bad wear on your tire. And rebound has quite a profound effect on that. This little unit on the top here, you don't get them on all shocks, you don't see them on your standard ones, and you don't see them on all aftermarket race ones. We don't use them in the Triumph Triple Challenge. But this is a preload adjuster. So effectively, <clears throat> there's your spring. If you said it was a 100 pound spring, for every inch that it compresses would require 100 pounds of pressure. By the time you've gone two inches, you're putting 200 pounds of pressure on the spring, and so it goes on. Now, what the preload does is, is effectively sets the ride height up of the bike and exactly how stiff this spring is gonna be. So, if you wanna soften the bike up because it's wet, or because you're riding on your own, you can use a preload adjuster to do that by taking a little pressure off of the spring. If, uh, if you need to go the complete reverse, you can do exactly the same again. And it's easy, because normally you have to get a spanner on here and collar this thing round and basically compress the spring. With that, all you, do have, all you have to do is turn it, and that's a hydraulic preload adjuster, and that basically tensions the spring for you. So it's actually quite a useful piece of kit. And we use it a lot when we're transferring from uh, uh, wet to uh, wet to dry uh, settings. Now, that's your rear suspension unit for all intents and purposes. I'm also gonna cover the front one and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you set it up. So let's pick up the next piece. Right, 
here we go. Now I hope you can see this, um, I'm sure probably some of you have seen them before anyway. This is what you find inside your fork and then coming up on this section here is your spring and then you'd have that adjuster sitting on the top here that you use to twiddle and set up your preload and rebound etc etc and this is your your rod that runs through what we call a cartridge unit and this is a 20 millimeter cartridge unit and they get bigger and i'll show you a bigger one in a moment so if i unscrew this little fella and take the top off and by the way it's not easy to get these things out a lot of people think can i just change my springs by undoing the top of the fork and the answer is no you can't you need special tools to be able to disassemble a fork and to be able to work with it. So, here we go. For those of you that have an interest in that, that's the internal workings of a fork. And what you can see on the top here, or the bottom here I should say, is your stack. And on each end of this stack you've got shims. And those shims can be pushed apart by the oil passing through. And depending on how stiff those shims are, to how much you can control the flow of oil through the fork. So you control the way the fork actually reacts. This little fella here, you might have heard the term a top out spring. And what you'll find interesting about that, is you can see it's got two different types of windings on it. Spaced windings and quite tight windings. That means effectively it's a a progressive spring. Let's turn around the other way, it'd certainly be a progressive spring. And the idea of, of that is to take some of the shock out if the, the fork literally dives or in a corner she sinks right to her full length of play and then you've got this bit of top out spring here just to help out a little bit. So that unit sitting in there, the whole thing is immersed in oil <clears throat> and that is effectively moving up and down that cylinder like a piston and oil is passing each of the shim stacks and that's how you get your control. Your rebound on a front fork, actually, well, I mean you won't be able to see it on this cam, but this tube here is hollow and there is another rod which goes inside there and right at the very top of your bike, on the top of your fork, you've got a tiny little screw and when you adjust that screw, you're pushing that rod down and that rod pushes a pin down into the centre, into the stack and then that literally again, that needle moving in and out, just like the old days when, when you carburetors, when you had needles going through into jets. It's a very similar kind of concept, that that needle is being moved in and out of a hole and therefore you're making it bigger or smaller and controlling the flow rate of oil. So you're controlling the flow rate when the piston goes down and you're controlling the flow rate when it goes up. One question that some everybody normally asks is, well, why do you want to control the rate going down? Why do you want to control the rate going up? Um, for me, um, rebound to me is almost a more important setting in getting right than the compression on the way down. But obviously, you don't want the fork to dive too much. You don't want all the weight of the bike onto its nose. You want to be able to feel the front wheel coming towards you. So where you have that suspension set up on the front, you want to be able to feel that tyre into the tarmac so it gives you the confidence that the bike is gripping and the only way that's going to be done is when you get your suspension set up nicely. If it's too soft, the bike's going to dive way too far, the pitch is going to be right down and you're going to get extremely light on the back end and the thing's going to want to go in there on its nose and it'll be quite uncomfortable and I would have thought difficult to steer. If you've got the suspension too stiff then the forks are not going to dive at all, the bike isn't going to sit on its nose at all uh, so, um, uh, you know, you, you, you uh, sorry that, um, 675 boy, I don't know what happened there fella, but hopefully you can get back. Um, so the bike will turn in, she needs to sit on her nose. So it's a real compromise, a real balance on, on, on each of these th uh, things. On the rebound, controlling the rate at which the fork starts to come back up, well that's important when you're coming out of the corner. Because as you get on the gas, if the bike wants to sit up and it sits up quickly, you effectively lengthen the wheelbase. And if you lengthen the wheelbase, the bike wants to run wide. So if you find yourself coming out of the corner and getting on the gas and you, you know, the bike just seems to keep pushing over to the left, then um, uh, your rebound control is kind of quite important on that one. So I'm going to put this down. I'm going to show you the last piece. This little fella here. Um, 
you will see is much larger than the one that I was holding a moment ago, said the bishop to the actress. That's the 20 mil standard unit. This is a 30 mil Odin's unit. This is what you see a lot of the big boys using. Um, very different, well, it's not that different. You can see, notice the spring here is all evenly spaced. That's a linear spring, which is what racers use. They want the feel all the way down to the bottom to be absolutely constant. Because they're holding on the brake, they've got a feel for where the tyre is and how it's behaving and how much braking pressure they can put on. And they literally are computing this in milliseconds and they need a good solid linear feel all the way through the range. So that's why these springs are like that. If you look at them in your bike, on a road bike, you'll find that they're much tighter coiled at the bottom and much looser at the top. So it's easier to come down, but then as it gets down, it gets progressively harder. So they call them progressive springs. The big difference between the way that those units operate and this unit operates is the fact that on your standard forks, you have compression, preload and rebound all on each fork, just like you have on a rear shock. But when you start using these units, you don't. You will have rebound on one fork and compression on the other fork. So if you do start using these units, remember they do differ from what you use as standard and the way that you adjust them is totally different. So bear that in mind or you might find yourself getting into a bit of a problem. Now these are 30 mils. You're probably going to pay something in the region of five, six hundred pounds each. So, you know, budget 11, 1200 pounds for a pair of these things. Um, but they are incredibly adjustable and you can put different types of springs into them, in which case you can with your standard bike, in fairness to you. Um, and you can get them set up exactly as the rider likes uh, for the kind of feel that they like as well. But there is a, a, a number of these uh, types of product that are out on the market, Showa, Olins, I think Nitron are gonna be coming up with something in the not too distant future. So you should shop around, Bitubu is another manufacturer, which we see quite a lot of. If I take that unit off, you can probably see, if you remember what the last one looked like, there is a, a massive difference in terms of the engineering and the overall size of these things as well and the amount of shim stacks has actually been placed and I'm sorry I know you can't see this stuff but I can um, but there's literally about five sets of shims on there and you can get them in different uh, thicknesses so they're bent by the oil easier or, or not so easy and again that starts to give you your control and your flow so that is a basic understanding of suspension what it does rebound what it does compression <coughs> preload. The last subject I'm going to touch on before I take questions is the preload side. You will have probably, many of you heard, will have, will have heard of the term static sag and rider sag. Static sag is setting the bike up so it's balanced. It's going an equal amount front and rear um, without a rider on board. And then when we do rider sag we sit the rider on board uh, and uh, and then we measure the sag again and as a sag I should probably explain how much the shock compresses with either the weight of the bike or with the weight of the right with the weight of the rider and the weight of the bike and so I'm, has everybody lost their sound possibly no big no big Pete still got no okay so I'll carry on then <clears throat> so as a general rule if the travel on your front forks is say 125 mil and the travel on your rear shock is 60 mil with a rider on board you kind of want about one third of the travel taken up with the weight of you and the bike so it's one third of the, it's just a benchmark it's not cast in stone but just as a benchmark around a third and when we look at static sag tends to be significantly less, around 10, 12 millimetres on the rear, around 25 to uh, 30. Now that that occasional stammer, uh, St Mark's, is, is me. <laughs> I've got the nerve, nerves and heebie-jeebies. Um, so that's, uh, that's static sag and that's rider sag. So, you know, I've covered an awful lot of stuff there and I guess you'd like to ask some questions. So I'm going to hand it over to you guys now and I'll 
I'll do what I can to answer them as best I can. Who's coming in with the first one? I would like to know if I should soften the suspension since I'm at best something over 60kg with all my riding gear. Gosh, I wish I could be 60kg. I think I must have been 14 the last time I was 60kg. Um, yeah, you can. Um, I mean, I don't know what the UK average weight is, but when a manufacturer sets a bike up, they have to consider about you, the rider, and the weight of a potentially a pillion as well. So the springs tend to be overrated just for a single rider um, by themselves, you know, for, for maximum performance. So yeah, you can change the spring on your standard shock. You could make that lighter. Um, and you could change the springs in the front, or you might just be able to take some of the preload off or change the air gap. Any of these little things that might be cheaper than actually changing the springs may well help you make soften the suspension up. If you want to know what kind of spring rates you should go for, then give us a ring here and I'll have a chat with Nitron um, uh, based on your body weight and our experience of what the 675 is like, uh, and we can give you an indication of where you should go. Um, do we, uh, do, yes, we do, yes. Um, Yes, we do. So if you need stuff like that done, then yeah, by all means, give us a ring. Of course, we can help. What other skill of do you think it's worth changing the cartridge kit and shock when it's standard stuff? When is when? It's the standard stuff considered crap. <gasps> Could you say such a thing? Um, oh God, that's a difficult question. Um, I mean, first of all, I wouldn't really bother changing suspension until I was track day. I don't think it's particularly a worthwhile enhancement for the road, unless your stuff's really performing badly. You know, you get your girlfriend on the back in the front sort of waving about or whatever, then yeah, you know, you may seriously need to think about it if the, if the shock's very, very old and stuff like that. Um, if you're, as you've just said, beginner at group track days, no, I don't think you quite ready I, I think when you start moving up to the upper end of the say middle group you know if you're going around Brands Hatch Indy and you're starting to hit I don't know uh, 52s and 53s then maybe that's a time to start thinking about getting some good suspension in but you can do a lot with what you've already got by changing springs changing oils um, and, and keeping the stuff in good condition it works pretty good um, it's just not going to work that great when you really start to push it. So at beginner, I'd say run with what you've got. Look at yourself when you start getting to the, say, the top third of the um, uh, inters group. Okay? At the moment. <laughs> it's got ambition there. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. Ambitions end in crashes. Um, who's got another question? How is talent. I mean, it's always there's normally suspension engineers and people like that at the tracks. I know they charge you a little bit of money to do this kind of stuff, but they can normally get a fairly good idea of certainly setting up the sag on a bike. I mean, most bikes you'll come across at go track day, and people haven't even considered doing that, and that's just a a really good starting point um, uh, if you if you're going to go start doing track days. And also, the other thing you want to be seriously considering, guys, is tyres. You know, I, I'm not totally convinced about some road tyres being used on track days, especially if you're a, you know, a middle group rider and you're kind of up in the top third of it. Um, the the road stuff is designed to heat up very quickly, so yeah, it's good in some ways, but it can also get a bit too hot, um, and it tends not to uh, maybe have the uh, tread patterns to to deal with. Uh, with real severe lean angles at high speed. Uh, how much difference can you get from just changing the oil in the forks? Well, um, we'll, t we'll change the entire, I'll come to that one in a minute. How difference? Yeah, I mean, you can make a reasonable difference. In, in the standard fork units, there's normally about a 10 weight oil, which is quite, when you know, it's cold, it's quite thick and quite gloopy. Um, when uh, we use race oil, we go down to a five weight. Now, basically, if you can imagine, like I said to you before, uh, shim stacks. Uh, the, actually, hold on there one moment. Let me get something out. 
This is something I prepared earlier, which I made out of paper mache uh, and fairy liquid bottles, as all good Blue Peter presenters do. Um, this is a clutch pack, obviously, but if I could demonstrate a similar theory to what shim stack is, literally a shim stack, the, the, the plates are round like this, or the little shims are round like this, and they're all sat one on top of the other. And what the oil does is forces its way through these shims, these sets of shims, it literally forces them open. And depending on how thick they are, will depend on how much force the, the, the oil's got to exert. So effectively it slows down with the more force that it's got to exert. So when you start, uh, uh, if you change the oil over and you make it thinner effectively, it will flow through those. So the, the suspension will work, if you like, more efficiently. It will certainly work faster but there's no guarantee that the standard stuff is going to have the um, the standard internals are going to have the control to be able to cope with that. So it's a bit of a trial and error thing, and you'll certainly notice the difference. Can you chuck me a bit of um, paper, Craig, please? Because I've got goopy hands, gloopy hands now. Um, there's some on the side of um, Dave's bench, on the side of his toolbox. No, left hand side. Oh yes. Um, so. Uh, 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 so yes, that's a question to yours, uh, answer to yours. So I should say, uh, we'll change the tyres up, set the suspension setup. Not significantly. Not, I mean, it would for a you know, if you put put a different set of tyres on Tommy Hill's bike. Yes, it may well do, um, but for our, our, us average billies, no, well, I, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference. It will make a difference to the way the bike handles, in terms of you know how quickly it'll go over onto its side and stuff like that. Um, uh, when you try to lean the bike into a corner, but I don't think it'll make too much of a difference on suspension. Um, suspension is commonly known as a dark art or magic. Why do people think of it? It's, it's so difficult because it is difficult. Um, you know, when when I'm sitting here with Luke, I think I know the basics of suspension, and then I get somebody like Perry from HM talking, and it's a different league. And and you know, tire compounds and and uh, all of these things affect so much the handling of the bike. But suspension-wise, you know, you'd think it was fairly straightforward, but sometimes it can be quite complex. Sometimes what your the rider might be feeling is the problem is at the front, but actually it's at the back, which is what Motic will tell you, uh, or, or vice versa. So yeah, I think it is difficult actually. It is a bit of a black art, but the basics of setting something up so it works reasonably well all of the time is not that difficult. Um, other questions tonight to be based around suspension setup. No, you can ask me anything you want, anything you like. I don't mind. Whatever you guys want to know, if I know the answer, I'll give it to you. Um, uh, tell me about optimum tyre pressures for summer. If we get, what well, is that? Uh, summer on a track day or summer on the road? Because I've got to be honest with you, so I don't know road pressures. I really, really don't. Um, and on track days, it completely depends on the brand of tyre that you're using. Pirelli tyre pressures are completely different from Dunlops. Dunlops are closer to Michelin's. Um, you really ought to seek professional advice at the side of the circuit about that one, about guys doing that all day long, because there is no simple answer to that one, I'm afraid, especially from, from, from a track point of view. And if it's from a road point of view, you really ought to follow your manufacturer's recommendations in your setup book. Got that one in. Um, Bum, 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 bum. Thanks, wasn't a dig, just thought I'd mark out some guidelines. Oh, what's that then? Oh yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you some marks, cheers. What else do we, what other questions have we got? Anybody wanna go off subject? What about steering dampers? Can I change the stiffness? Yeah, uh, oh, I, I don't have any steering dampers that aren't adjustable. Um, for me, I like the ones that sit on top of the handlebars, uh, where I can adjust it literally as I'm going along. Um, the original one, no, you can't. No, no, you're right. Yes, you're quite right. Aftermarket ones are all adjustable. I, I, you know, if you're going to go track day riding, put a proper steering damper on your bike. Um, you may one day really, really need it. Um, Sprint, yeah, there's a manufacturer. Know them fairly well. We've used their products. Fine, um, you know. If that's uh, your chosen brand. The only thing I, I, I'm, I think Sprint do one that goes across the handlebars, Ducati esque. So they're not too bad. You can get at those while you're going along. Uh, we use the uh, Pitbull units, uh, and believe me, we've used just about every um, 
conceivable damper you can imagine um, with all the, the riders that have been through the TTC uh, looking for a product that is both reliable uh, and works extremely well and they do. Um, the other thing that you ought to be preparing yourself for oh, crash protection. This is of course a crash bung, crash mushroom, whatever you want to call it, GB Racing um, have developed a slightly new crash bung recently. Um, little known, but actually T3 Racing and GB Racing worked together to develop the very first products that I know a lot of you have now got on your bikes, these composite plastics. Uh, they came from the idea of uh, composite units that were made to protect um, uh, CCTV cameras and uh, Graham very cleverly adapted it and he and I worked together for quite some time using the Triumph Triple Challenge as a testing ground for nearly a year uh, to develop these products and we as T3 Racing are always interested in hearing about good ideas that people have got about products that could be developed for bikes. So you know you're the guys who ride them every day, uh, you're the guys who might come up with something so you know, if there's ever you think, you know, I've got a great idea about a product, but you know, I've got the money to put it together or something, come and see us and come and talk to us about your ideas. And you know, if, it, if we think it's commercial and and it's going to help people, then uh, yeah, sure, we'll take a look at it. But these little fellas, you want to um, be careful with these. They're good and bad. Uh, they do protect your bodywork, but if they happen to catch on a curb stone, they will also flip the bike. Um, so that the you know it's a bit of a tough one that one whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, composite engine covers, no question about those. It's a really good thing to have with you road ride or you track ride. They are a good thing, and if you track ride, especially if you race, you've got to have them on anyway. They, 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 um, it's one of the stipulations. So I don't think they're a bad uh, a bad product for you to look at. So that's another one that you can do quite cheaply. And believe me, you might not think it, but especially on the six seven five, on the front right hand side cam chain cover the very bottom bolt the first one facing the front of the bike if it goes down i've seen those bend and snap off um, and literally take a chunk of the crankcase out with it and if it does you could be in serious trouble and need literally another set of crankcases and that's probably a good 1500 pound cost before you've even started building an engine so um Definitely put one on that one, whatever happens. Right, uh, Big Pete, off subject. I've swapping my engine out for another snap gudging pin. Yeah, come across a couple of those. I connected everything up and put, I've got a funny feeling you and I have had a chat, uh, and putting new plugs and battery over. Or all I get when I press the button is a click of the starter relay, but nothing else. Any thoughts? Ooh. Um, yeah, you should have brought it to us. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Pete, I wasn't, I'll, I'll take the mic there. Um, I know it's going to sound really dumb, but the two most common things I go for when a starter relay clicks like that is uh, I go to the battery, check the voltage, make sure it's above 11.6, um, and uh, um, uh, check um, what's the other one? Your terminals. Definitely check your terminals uh, on your battery that are well connected. One of the ways you can check both of those very quickly is just put a starter pack on it and see whether she'll turn over from there. After that, you can be searching through for a whole number of things, but it sounds like it just simply hasn't got enough juice like flat battery, but that could be lead on to something else. It could lead on to a regulator rectifier issue, it could lead on to a generator issue, uh, it could lead on to a battery issue or just plain connections to it. Uh, stuff like that. So I would check all of that stuff first before you uh, go any further. Process of elimination basically. Start at the battery end and then work your way back out from there and, and see where it leads you. Um, if you can't find it, bring it down and we'll get our auto electrician on it and I'm sure he will find it. Um, I tell you, do you still sell protectors for the corners of the fuel tank? Yeah, we do. Um, we do. We do big ones. Um, that literally come virtually across the whole length of the uh, the fuel tank. Uh, well, certainly the bit that juts out anyway. And we've also made them, because I've seen them where they're quite small. And I get that. They look much nicer than ours, I think. 
but I don't know whether they would work as well as ours because one of the things that we did was we made it a slightly bigger than the tank so you could literally fill it in with mastic and stick over and then if the tank goes down onto that panel it hits the carbon fiber it hits the mastic and with a little bit of luck it doesn't get to your tank um, but I, I might be doing these people an injustice um, I'm sure one of you guys probably used them and, 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 and can tell me um, yeah I have a similar problem and it was the regulator well you know the regulator rectifier if that goes basically the bike's not charging same thing with the generator generator is a three phase unit so you can check each of the outputs off of the generator to know if it's throwing some charge at the regulator rectifier. If the battery's not getting that charge, it could be regulator rectifier. But as I said, just put a starter pack out on as a starting point and, um, and see whether you can get it to fire up. And uh, if you can, then, um, uh, then you've probably got a battery issue. And start by giving it a full charge, putting it on the bike, seeing how it behaves. Uh, and if it goes flat fairly quickly, you can either change the battery and hope that it is that, or you get your regulator rectifier checked. And there's a good company called Electrics World, a chap called Pete, if you can get hold of the bugger. Um, but uh, Electrics World, they're very good. They can even send you out, I think they even have it on their website actually, uh, uh, an Adobe download to tell you exactly how to uh, uh, check your, well, here you go, you can check your regulator rectifier. Go to a company called Electrics World, either ask them to send it to you or see if they've got it on their website and you can download it and you can do your own tests and that will definitely answer that question for you. So, what else have we got? He was a big brave man, rebuild, I assume you must be some sort of engineer if you're rebuilding your uh, your motor because that's, um, that's quite a task to take on. Um, uh, no. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> For God's sake, prime the engine before you start it, or you'll be in real trouble. It might be a saving grace that you haven't done that yet, but make sure you prime that engine before you start it. It is the most common mistake I see people make, and you will ruin all your hard work within about 800 RPM. So for God's sake, um, don't make that mistake. Might be daft, Pete. I had one in. I I had two in six months. We're talking about gudgeon pins midway going. Can I go through the engine priming sequence? <laughs> God, blimey, you don't want much, do you? Um, the, the simplest way to do it is actually take disconnect the spark plugs. Actually, it's best not to have spark plugs in at all, but if you've already done all that and you've got all your air box on and God knows what else, then uh, you're going to have to... Um, uh, you can do it if there's no fuel in the bike so she won't start, so take the tank off or something like that. Uh, put a battery charger onto the battery, uh, turn the ignition on, hit the starter switch and keep letting her turn over until the oil light goes out on the clocks. When the oil light goes out on the clocks, that means the engine's up to pressure. Dave uses a, um, an airline to do it, but you can easily make a mistake doing that and blow too much air into the engine and blow seals. So I suggest easiest way, battery pack, switch on the ignition, Make sure there's no fuel in the bike at all where well, you took the tank off and press the, the, the start button and uh, uh, for God's sake, hope there's no fuel in the system otherwise it might fire up for a short while and you don't want it to do that. Um, and just keep holding the start button until the red battery, until the red uh, oil light goes out on the dashboard and then um, you'll be up to pressure. So there's your question answered. Pete? Maybe it was a blessing, like I say. Maybe it was a blessing in disguise that it didn't uh, that it didn't actually start first time round. If you haven't primed it, you would have been a very unhappy puppy very quickly. So, we've we got any questions? Does anybody want to go back over any of the subjects on suspension? Was that all a bit complicated? Did I go into too much detail? Anybody want to ask me to go through any of it again, or is there anything you guys would particularly like to know? Is it wrong to put a Dunlop D211 soft on front and sport mark? Oh, do you know what? I really don't know the question, uh, the answer to that question. I, I'm sorry. You would have to have a chat with Dunlop on that one because I'm not familiar with either of those two tyres, unfortunately. Um, I'm assuming they're the same brand. I'm assuming this, they're radials uh, or, or um, I can't imagine that they'll cross -plies. 
Um, and I think that's one of the major stipulations, but you're probably best off talking to the manufacturer about that. Um, if you can't afford to buy a shock and forks in one hit, if you change one, which would you go for? Shock or cartridge? Shock first. Do the rear first. Um, some might argue with that actually. <coughs> some would say if you lose the rear, you can save it. If you lose the front, you're not coming back. Um, so one might argue about that. But me personally, yeah, I'd start with the rear shock. Change that first. Uh, you can even do it on your standard unit. You can um, change the spring on that for something softer or stiffer or whatever the case may be. Uh, and get that. Just get the bike set up with the right sag. And you'll be quite amazed how much that changes the way the bike handles. I mean, last time we had this seminar, we talked about uh, dyno work and, and the exhaust system. And to be honest with you, most of you that come in here um, come in for two reasons, either for dyno work and for the exhaust opening up, or you come in for suspension. So that's why I figured that was a, a, a good subject to, um, to cover. Um, Mikey, I'm looking at returning to club racing on my 10 after five years on a CBR. Should I be worried about the heat exchanger cracking itself? Don't really want to put the pump kit on as it will probably be used on the road as well. Well, the pump kit wouldn't make too much difference. Um, uh, I know that they are, I think Triumph um, recommend it uh, for um, help with the heat exchanger unit. Depends how far you want to go with this, Mikey. Um, you know, if I was club racing, I had a little bit of money, I would buy an oil cooler. Um, we are developing one here um, using some products of our own and some products that Triumph make. And we will have one done soon because we need it for Luke's bike behind me. Um, I don't know what the price of these things is going to be. I think the standard heat exchanger units are about 146 quid, and that might be plus VAT. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, so my answer to you would be change the heat exchanger twice during the course of the season. So a new one at the beginning of the season and a new one halfway through. That should stop you having a major issue. Um, fitting of the pump it's not a particularly expensive process um, you can actually do it with the engine in situ um, but it is quite hard work um, but it is possible um, but if you really want to be 100% sure and 100% safe then I would say um, I would say fit an external oil cooler to it and it's not a difficult thing to make up. You need a blanking plate that goes over where the heat exchanger is now. You need two pipes coming off of that into an oil radiator. It's not complex, not rocket science. You could probably make one yourself if you could find a little oil cooler from a, from a eBay or something like that. I was about to say scrap yards, but they don't think there's any of them left anymore, is there? Um, you could make one up yourself. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't be uh, impossible to do. So. Um, that's what I. That's where I would go, Mikey. I would, uh, I would change, um, change the unit, or I would uh, swap it out for something else. They're, they're not always going, but if they do, it's a bloody mess, and um, it's, it takes quite some time to fix it because it fills all the radiator and everything up. The way you can tell when the heat exchanger is gone is your um, reservoir on the side of your bike is going to have a white white sort of sort of a creamy substance in there, oil and water mixed together. Uh, and it will no doubt blow out the side of the bike and you'll be there'll be no mistake that it happens. But it's just a, a real bugger to have to uh, uh, clean it all. Um, what do I suspect causes the gudgeon pin failures? I've got no idea to be uh, honest with you, um, St Mark's. I no idea. I mean there's been a few, we didn't see any for quite some while then there's been a few uh, and I haven't seen any more recently uh, who knows I really don't know I've got no idea um, you know if you are worried about gudging pins and you're racing a bike then you know, it may not be such a terrible idea to have some made we've even thought about doing it ourselves but of course it would be uh, illegal 
um, at BSB to be running aftermarket gudgeon pins, or at least I think it will be, so it's not something we've, we've done yet, but there's nothing to stop you doing that. Trouble is, be prepared to pay a lot of money, because if you're only going to make three, they're going to charge you. Um, that going down the Brembo route, what's a good way of upgrading the front brakes for a budget of 200-ish? Four. Um, when you say going, I mean, are you talking about calipers when you say Brembo route midweek? Is that what you're thinking about? Um, because I've got to say, I think the standard brakes on 675 are about as good as you ever want to get. I mean, the boys in the TTC um, are using standard stuff and I mean, they're going a hell of a lick. Um, but yeah, if I was going to change it, yeah, master cylinder. If you really wanted to improve it, you could get a big ball master cylinder on there. Uh, and you'd probably get less brake fade and stuff like that. But also pads. Um, pads make a big difference. Discs do on the um, O10 bikes. Uh, well, O8 onwards, I think. Um, changing discs is not a bad idea. And it, and it will improve your braking without a doubt, especially if you get the um, you know the kind of uh, slash cut types. But what you also got to bear in mind, they're going to wear your pads out a lot faster too. So bear that one in mind. Um, if I just wanted more braking force, I would go for a master cylinder. If I wanted more braking force, possible well, it might be not so much force, but different feel. Um, you know, some people like Luke likes his lever absolutely like brushes it with his finger and it's breaking. Uh, you know, he likes a really, really solid um, uh, brake master cylinder, uh, or feel from the brake lever, I should say. So it's, it's also about you know, personal preference, but I hope that answers uh, some of your questions. The way we disc make any difference to the standard? <laughs> What's that? way we disc are they any better than a standard disc pad? Uh, and actually the actual discs. The actual yeah. discs, yeah, 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 definitely. Because I mean, you, you've got potentially better cooling. Yeah. Um, you've got larger areas where the water can be effectively dispersed during the wet. Um, and the fact that they're, a lot of them are slashed. Yeah. Basically, almost, it's, it's almost like going in a butcher's and it's shaving off your pads, yeah. you know, yeah. even though it's, it, but so, because it wears them much quicker. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. And if you've got thicker discs as well, you'll again get a totally different feel from the front lever. If you go to Brembo Master Cylinders, I can't remember what the range is now, but so it's, so it's something like 16 to 20 mil. And each time you go up, you can effectively have, you know, if you want a 20 mil, you could have six pot set of calipers. You've got 16 mil, you'd have a two pot set of calipers. So you could put a, an 18 or 19 bore on there on a two on a two pot, and it'd be a bit of a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, but by God, you'd have to have some brakes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's something that you can uh, uh, you can think about. Changing discs definitely will make a difference to how, how the front of the bike feels. Who else have we got? What else other questions have we got? I'm looking at my turn at a, just a curiosity, do you need to have do you need to have a PA first aid kit on the bike in the UK? That's an odd question. You're best off carrying a nurse around with you all of the time. <laughs> An attractive one. <laughs> I don't know. No, I don't think you do. Do you? Have to have a first aid kit on a bike? I think in some European countries you have to. Do you? Yeah, but I'm not sure. Craig thinks that maybe in some European countries you need to, but not here <laughs> in the UK, because we need it. <laughs> Stop falling off. <laughs> You're unlucky. Ah, where are you from then? Where are you talking to us from? Ah, okay. Hey, cool. <laughs> Slovak. Slovenia. Slovenia. Yeah. Blimey. Welcome. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions anyone's got? Is that a 
Big Ten Fours. So Big Ten Fours, bike behind you. Who's Big Ten Four? He was out um, on the ride. It's a black bike, but it's this, not his. This one here is Stuart, the uh, guy who came down, the Scottish guy, the Marine. Yeah, yeah, that's his then, yeah. That's his? Yeah, all right. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we broke it. <laughs> Steve Elliott, there you go. Is that him there? Yeah, that's him there. Oh, God, yeah. Right, okay. Come it's to have a look at your bike, did you? <laughs> there it is, look, Scorpion exhaust system. Haven't changed the rear shock yet. Forks are just being reworked. Um, should be back in within a couple of days. Now, you must have some questions about racing, Steve. You must have thousands of them. This is your moment. You can ask me now instead of when you come down and pick your bike up. <laughs> I should tease him actually, shouldn't I? I say, no, you should come and ask me the questions when you come down because that'll give me time to write your bill out. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our scrub's worth buying off eBay. Um, Do you know what? You're probably better off going to any club meeting and any race meeting, BSB or otherwise, and you will see people selling scrubs for 50 quid a set. Just kind of have a look at the profile of the tyre and just see, you know, because they might all be completely knackered on the right and, and look fairly juicy on the left. It's not just about how much tread they've got left in there. You actually want to look at the profile of the tyre as well. And if it's too far gone on one side, then unless you can turn them, then maybe not such a good idea because you will feel a massive difference between going right and left if the tyre is particularly worn on one side. Um, but normally, sort of, you know, 50 quid a set, you can get them all over the place. Um, uh, and uh, I'll go to a race meeting and get them, because then you can literally see them in your hand, you know what you're buying. On eBay, you could be buying early, you know, and you get it and you pay 50 quid for it and the thing's crap or it's been in someone's garage for two years and sat there and has gone harder than my mother's cheesecake. So, um, uh, I would I would go to the racetracks and buy yours if I were you. Uh, yikes! Servicing oil changes extra triumph main service every six k. Would you do any more in between? I've often done an extra oil change in between. Really depends on what kind of oil you're using. I mean six thousand miles. Um, do you know what? Uh, it's, if you like changing your oil, that makes you feel comfortable. Then you change it because you can never do an engine any harm by changing the oil too often. That's that's how I look at it. Um, that's something, a bit of maintenance that you just really can't get wrong. So if you're happy doing that, I would say carry on doing it because it will just mean your engine will last longer than anybody who doesn't do that. Um, everything has a shelf life, including a motorbike, and the manufacturers have probably worked that out uh, based on you know being serviced every six. Do it every three, it will last longer. Uh, not race related, but is it? Fully synth oil always better than semi thin suit. Try to change recommendations to semi last year. Yeah, um, now, uh, yeah, it can make a difference to a lot of bikes. In uh, racing, not so much on the road, although I suspect it will make a difference on the road, but in racing, the big difference tends to be to the clutch. Uh, because we're doing race starts and, you know, fully around on the rev range and slipping the clutch. Sometimes a fully synthetic oil is just too good and the clutch plates don't like it and they will slip and then eventually they will burn themselves out. Um, that is not to say that that is the case for all fully synthetic oils. I have used, I'm not going to name brands, um, but I have used other brands and not had that problem and I've used some other brands and I have had that problem. Um, we currently use Castrol. Um, I thought I had a can of it here. Yeah, that should not pay my moment. I'll be back in a second. Castrol Power uh, One Racing. I suspect probably not the cheapest product on the market, but we've used it and we've had absolutely no issues. We're on our second season with this oil now. Uh, and there's only other, and the one other manufacturer of oil that I've used for more than one season. Um, so I would uh, I would strongly recommend that as a product that I know works. Um, like I say, you can buy other products, 
probably less expensive. Uh, I couldn't tell you how well they work till they don't work. I can only tell you what I know does work. Um, I used Castrol and Silkaline. I used Castrol and Silkaline. Bikers felt happier on the Castrol. Interesting comment, that one. I don't think you're terribly far away. Um, even if the spark plug's better or just a bit of a gimmick. Do you know what? Um, I don't know. I, I've got to be honest with you, so I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know whether they really are better. Uh, yeah, you know, the bigger, better spark you can get, the more efficiently something burns, the more efficiently it burns, the more power it makes, etc., etc. So in theory, yes. In the real world, I don't know. Uh, I've, I've even Luke's bike runs on the standard Triumph spark plug. We haven't put anything special in that at all. So uh, I would say that product works perfectly well for what you're going to need. Um, what is good to check between sessions, races on a track day? Well, I'll tell you what, I would definitely be checking morning and evening is my oil level. Uh, always look at that and look at it very closely and make sure that it's topped up. Go around, uh, um, uh, just go around the bike. Um, in between sessions, I like to check my tyre pressures, get an idea of what they are when they're fully up to temperature. So, you know, I leave the warmers on for about an hour. Then I check my tyre pressures. I always measure them hot. Um, and, uh, yeah, just to look around the bike is, is you know, check your chain tension. Um, depending if you're at track days, you know, you'll be changing sprockets and things like that. So you always want to be checking your chain tension. Wheel alignment. You know, a lot of you guys, um, I'll show you a little gadget I use in my toolbox which you might find useful um, um, this is a chain alignment tool um, and what's called profi laser cat I don't know what that is I can't remember who I bought it from actually but that's the little gadget that it is. I'll hold that closer to the camera for you chaps so that you can see it. Um, and if I shine um, that, it don't come on. <laughs> Who's borrowed that? And... Oh, let me try another one. Maybe the battery's died. Someone's probably used that and left it on. Yeah, here we go. I'm not going to do anybody down shining a laser at the screen, am I? <laughs> um, so, I don't know whether you can see that, guys, but uh, I'm sort of pointing a, a, a laser beam at my own image on the screen there. Uh, and this little fella here, what you do is, you sit it on the side of the sprocket, and then you point, twist it down, keeping it flat against the sprocket, twist it down, and it shines on the chain. And as you move it up, it goes all the way up the length of the chain, and you can check that it's absolutely cock on in alignment. And that makes a big difference when you're riding on the roads as to how your tyre wears and everything else. So that's a really cool little gadget to buy, not particularly expensive. You can annoy the hell out of the cat with it, um, and you can show off to all your friends how professional you are. <laughs> that's a good idea, I prefer the cat thing, personally. Um, uh, what is it good to check between the tension and So, um, yeah, those sorts of things. Tire pressures, chain alignments, make sure your bolts are nice and tight. Make sure that you've got your bike fueled up before your sessions. Make sure your tires are up to temperatures. Um, and, uh, yeah, just generally keep an eye on the bike because um, things come loose when people tinker. And, uh, and if you're always tinkering with a race bike, make sure everything's done up. Uh, I found it the other way. Gear changes are much smoother now and silkily. Okay, well, each their own. Um, is there a difference between calibers between 2006 and 2009 except colour, i.e. they take the same pads? Um, no, I don't think that's quite correct. If it, I mean, you guys will probably be able to tell me better than I can remember myself. But as I remember it, they changed over to the different calipers in about 2008. Back yeah. end of 2008, yeah. I think it was. So a 2009 model should have the new type calipers on it. The 2006 um, hasn't. Um, I uh, can't say to you that I've ever asked any of my riders who's ridden both types of bike whether they actually did notice a difference in terms of the performance, but I would imagine there is. I mean, it's a much bigger caliper and it doesn't take the same set of pads. 
uh, without a doubt. I'm sure there's more area on the later ones. So um, you can't interchange pads between a 2006 and a 2009 model. And the way you can differentiate that bike like that very quickly, it's got a silver engine, it's gonna be an early model. If it's got a black engine, it's gonna be a later model. And I think they did do a few black engines still with the old type forks and yeah. sorry forks and calipers on. I think they I think they did, but I'm sure that ended at the end of 2008. So, Stewie, I, I might be mistaken on that one, but I don't think I am. Uh, what's involved with the decap modification on the exhaust? You can't ask that. We did it last time. Um, running a standard system with our own can and match. What's involved? Uh, what's involved with the DCAT is uh, we literally take the exhaust system off uh, and we give you an exchange unit where the CAT and the XUP have been removed and replaced by a straightforward piece of pipe. Um, <laughs> no, it's all right, Mike, I'll say to me. I was just playing. Um, and uh, then we refit it, leave your can on that you've got already. The most important part of it then is to uh, have it mapped uh, and I must be somebody on here tonight who's come down and had their bike mapped by us or I'd like to think there was somebody out there who's had it done by us anybody want to volunteer and tell us what their experience has been since we've done it uh, or maybe somebody at a later date pass the word around there's definitely some people on the site who've been in here and had uh, had their bikes done and Stewie um, but that's not your real name on there is it What's his name on there? Which one? Uh, Stuart, uh, Steve Elliott. Oh, Big Ten Four. Big Ten Four. He'll be able to tell you what it's all about when when he gets his uh, uh, when he gets his bike done. Um, it's great. I had it done Friday. Oh, okay. Wobbly. Wobbly. So, what differences did you notice, Wobbly, when after you'd had the bike done? Tell me about um, what you noticed when you started riding it, and then the other guys on here can hear it from you rather than from me. Big Tim for happy days. <laughs> yeah. You like that expression, don't you, Steve? Happy days. <laughs> Even the BMW was allowed on at the fest. <laughs> What's that? The uh, BMW that went on the um, dyno. Fest. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, sacrilege. <laughs> My dyno has never been <laughs> infected with any other brand uh, until that night. You have no idea how special you were. <laughs> um, that's it uh, sort of five past nine is it yeah right fast. okay well guys listen thank you very much for coming along and supporting it the next one that we're going to do I think we're doing live from trackside aren't we yeah if we can get yeah I think we're going side, yeah. out to a, we're going to take you for a day out um, trackside with Luke Jones and Pally Beckenen from the uh, uh, 777 boys and from from us as well um, and you'll be able to talk to them and ask them some questions about stuff and if we see anybody else like uh, Tommy Hill who I saw today I should have asked him actually uh, <laughs> loitering in the background we'll bring them over to have a chat with you as well uh, you won't have to see my ugly face this time you can talk to some handsome riders who are, are uh, 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 good guys um, uh, much better mid-range more power and much smoother uh, Good, excellent, wobbly, that's fantastic stuff. Guys, thank you very, very much for uh, your time and for coming along and supporting this. And um, I hope we see you live trackside in, I think, what, a couple of months' time? A month or so, Craig? Uh, yeah, that's it's yeah, June, July, I think, we're talking about. July, yeah, end of probably. June, stroke July. Yeah. Uh, you'll be able to come live trackside with us and uh, come meet some of the riders. Um, thank you, everybody. Great to see I wanted to uh, talk about this product, which I must admit I forgot to talk to you about when we had the web seminar. So Craig and I, or I should say Craig, very kindly uh, agreed to do a little recording for you afterwards, which you'll post up and you can take a look at it. This is an incredibly useful product. What is it? Merged. A piece of aluminium, effectively, made up to fit over the front bracketry of the bike. Now, what this is designed to do is one of the issues which I've seen very, uh, or I should say often, is if a bike goes down, just underneath the chassis, underneath the headstock, there is a little lug. And that lug controls how far the steering can go round. In other words, it'll only go so far so that should the bike crash, you wouldn't get your fingers trapped between the bike and the actual handlebars. 
So you can see that's the limit of what that turn is on your road bike, it'll be much more than that. And the reason it's limited is because of this. Now the problem with that is that if you were to have a crash on the road and the insurance company got involved, if that lug is broken off the bottom of the chassis, technically that is a write-off and most insurance companies won't allow you to re-weld the new lug onto there um, because it may not be safe. So they would literally write the bike off. Uh, which is not great news for you. A product like this will stop that ever happening. Because what it does, and Craig's going to move the camera just in so you can have a look at it on Luke's bike. Here's your air scoop. And literally, you take the bolts that are in the original air scoop out and you fit this bracketry over the top, both sides, and bolt it back into position. And then on our one, we've got some little lugs here which go against the fork so it will stop you turning it will stop that lug ever getting broken off and it will stop your hands ever getting trapped underneath the handlebars uh, because literally they've come too far around so that's what the actual product looks like the one that we do that's a specifically designed one that's carrying uh, um, his expansion tank and also a clock mounting for it and that's a Motec uh, a dash unit so it is slightly different from what we uh, supply for the road, but this is a really handy little piece of kit. And if there was one thing I would say, everybody should fit to their 675, one of these.